on October 25th, we're coming back to Melbourne for our first physical MLOps event. Whether you are just starting in the MLOps journey, improving in that space, or whether you have thousands of models in production, this event is for you. The type of things we're going to cover is MLOps for scale, and that scale can be number of models or the number of people in the team, or the number of prediction and inferences that need to be made in an hour or a minute or a second. So how to create effective MLOps for all those scenarios. We're going to cover MLOps processes and team structures. How do we organize ourselves and the talent that we have in our organizations for better results in MLOps. We're going to be looking at creating efficient and effective MLOps pipelines in an end-to-end. -end. What does the data look like, the feature stores, all the way to the model deployment, serving, monitoring, alerting, etc. We're also going to cover getting a C-level buy-in and support for the investment in this area. We're going to be covering what governance and good management looks like in this space. So wherever you are in your journey, the MLOps event in Melbourne on October 25th is going to help you increase the maturity of MLOps in your organization. I hope you can join us. See you then. I'd like to say a big thank you to our sponsors, Talent Insights. Talent Insights are Australia's leading specialist data recruitment business. With offices in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane, they're experts at providing recruitment strategy and building data teams for clients across industries Australia-wide. They provide recruitment solutions for all roles across the data lifecycle, including data engineering, data science, advanced analytics, customer and marketing insights, business intelligence, data product managers and data governance. They're skilled at finding the best permanent and contract hires for your business needs, as well as statement of work, project focus, data resources. At Talent Insights, relationships matter most. I can say from first-hand experience, Talent Insights are fantastic to work with. Whether you're a business leader within an HR network or a specialist data candidate, Talent Insights should be the first company you turn to for all your data recruitment needs. Find them at talentinsights.com.au. Hi and welcome to Data Futurology. Um, thanks for joining today. We have a super special guest. Uh, today we're going to be discussing all things uh, healthcare, data science and analytics in that space. I'm joined by Kevin Ross. He's the CEO of Precision Driven Health and he's additionally a board member and a director of research. So I'm keen to explore everything that he does. Kevin, thank you so much for joining. How are you going today? Yeah, thanks, Philippe. It's uh, great to be here. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to have a chat about lots of interesting things we're up to. Oh, mate, I, um, I'm very excited. Uh, I'm in my day job, uh, I work at a company that's a health tech company. Uh, so I love the, the healthcare content, obviously anything, uh, data analytics, data science, I love. Uh, so this ticks all the boxes. Uh, mate, I'm very keen to jump in. So maybe um, can you start by telling us a bit about your, your role and your remit at the moment? Sure. So I lead a health data science partnership in New Zealand. And so what we do is put together essentially data scientists, which includes both academics and people in industry with clinicians and with software companies. And our goal is to build products and services that are driven by data and data science, but leading to both health outcomes that are improvements for people and potentially commercial products as well. Um, so it's a really exciting kind of uh, public-private partnership set up. Uh, we've got support from a number of commercial organisations as well as New Zealand government and the health sector. Um, so it's a pretty exciting space to be in, obviously, with the last few years of COVID and New Zealand's about to undergo massive health reforms at the moment. Just every, It feels like everything's happening and data is driving so much of it that it's just the right place to be at the moment. Oh, mate, I can yeah, totally relate and I'm very excited by that. I've, I've only been in, in healthcare for the last two and a half years. Before that, I was in, in finance and um, obviously I'm biased, but it, it kind of feels like um, healthcare is starting to expect more from, from data, expecting more from, from the technology um, and uh, uh, consumers are wanting, um, well, goes to the name of, of one of your organizations, wanting uh, you know, more targeted, more relevant, more personalized uh, healthcare uh, services and recommendations, and for that to happen increasingly digitally, um, is that is that what you what you're seeing and the the space you uh, you're excited about? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we all know from our experience that 
you know, we can do so much more with technology than we used to, but it's kind of driven in a lot of places by, you know, finance or marketing or other areas where you can, we can see that we've matured a lot in terms of being able to understand data about people and about processes and about organizations. And we're utilizing it in lots of really fantastic ways outside of health. Mm-hmm. Health is really playing catch up in a lot of ways. And we kind of have the opportunity sitting out there where we know that health doesn't make all the use of all of the data that's there and therefore the you know the potential for growth and benefits is amazing and I, I sort of think of it in the context of you know people like you what do we want to say to that you know the moment we're used to people like you watch this movie or mm. people like you should buy this product and that's interesting and it's really cool data science but if you go to people like you are at risk of this health condition mm. or if people like you take this medication it might not work for you but people like you this will work and so if you think of you know that general context that's actually what you want from a health professional a a clinician that you go to you ask you know i'm dealing with something at the moment what what do you suggest they're always just thinking what do i know about this person what do i know about their condition and at the moment that's a very human level processing complex matching problem right where you you think i know about their medical risk history i know about medical research i know a bit about some tests they've taken but if you imagine what you could do if you sort of added the computational power of artificial intelligence and machine learning into that that's just simply helping process all of the stuff that's going on you know the potential is amazing for guiding people to understand themselves understand you know their outcomes and 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 a lot of that you know really is just driven by consumers getting that idea that i wish i could do in health what i could do elsewhere um so that that to me is quite exciting because it's a bit more of a pull now than it used to be um sort of people you know trying to push it into the into the sector definitely oh man that's that's um that's very very exciting and how how does the what you're just describing in terms of the, the consumer expectations um how does that line up with with your um I guess with your aims or with your visions and company company aims, company visions, and and what you're what you're trying to bring into into the market. Um, how do those line up? And then I'll ask you about some of the challenges that need to be overcome to bring the vision into into reality. Sure. So, health IT or health technology companies have almost always seen their customer as the system, whether that's the government, maybe an insurance, um, maybe a health provider, but you know, the customer has always been the big pockets of the big organizations. Mm. And I think what you're seeing, it's, and it's a slow change, to be honest, it's not happening overnight, but you're gradually seeing that demand coming from the consumer is a different type of industry. And so you're seeing people come at it from a much more, you know, customer focused, consumer oriented uh, kind of kind of mindset, which is really starting to think about ultimately what health is all about, which is can we give people really good care and how do you do that? And I think, you know, part of it is empowering consumers themselves to manage their own care, which you can do so much more through this technology. And therefore, you know, all of the sort of research as well as the clinicians, as well as the sort of technology focus is gradually shifting that focus from trying to, you know, serve the industry from sort of a big government, big uh, big provider um, to actually how can we make sure that this is working for people mm-hmm. and all different sorts of people and, and you know, there's the diversity of people and, and lots of issues that come as a result of that. But I think what you see is, you know, you're gradually just changing the mindset of actually ultimately if what I do is going to make the difference that I really want it to be. It's going to be because a consumer gets a better outcome. And if I can't, if I can't make it attractive to a consumer and interesting and useful, uh, then it's ultimately it's not going to work. Mm. So that you know, from a research partnership perspective, really changes the mindset because you're no longer sort of trying to solve the system problem, which are usually around kind of efficiencies and those sorts of things. You're actually trying to solve the outcome problem, which is what you might think of as mass personalization, right? You, mm. you want to be able to personalize without it being really complicated to deliver that, that personalized care. But we, always, we all know in health that we do a lot of things based on averages. And so you, know, you screen people at a certain age, you treat everyone with this condition with the same medication, you triage based on the same rules, regardless of how much you really know and how much history you've got. Um, so what we're trying to get to is a, a world where you actually take into account everything you know about someone when you give that advice and everything you know sometimes is a lot and sometimes it's not much at all but you still got to give advice and that sort of corpus of information you've got at the point of care you know includes 
everything from your medical history to these days things like genomics are coming into it which will actually personalize what might work for some people and not for others you've got devices that people walk in with that are consumer oriented and that they're you know they're mostly helping us do you know a bit of behavior change and these sorts of things but ultimately that data is really relevant to that clinical experience if mm -hmm. i'm treating someone who's had a hip replacement and I know something about their movements, then that's going to give me really good insight into actually what kind of patterns am I seeing? Are they are they doing what I ask them to do? Are they experiencing pain? They can potentially log that much more easily at the point that it happens rather than try and remember three weeks later, oh yeah, there was that day that wasn't so good. Um, there's just so many things you can do with that technology and ultimately that's all about creating and capturing that data and then translating it into something that's really useful for uh, the clinician and for the ultimately for the consumer um, who is sometimes a patient but most of the time not a patient mm -hmm. yeah exactly that's that's fantastic and and what are what are some of the some of the challenges to overcome uh, in order to bring that vision uh, closer closer to to now yeah there's all sorts of challenges as I mentioned before health feels a bit behind and sometimes that's the good reason we you know there's a general rule out there that it takes something like 17 years for something to be published as best practice before it's actually common practice and that you know there are some really sensible reasons why you end up with slow moving change in the health sector so you know and that's a lot to do with you want really good evidence you want to make sure it'll work for your population not not for others uh, not just for others but uh, that sort of regulatory environment has been built up over time in a way that doesn't really take into account how fast we can move and how fast we can gain knowledge now. So I sort of think of, you know, things like ethics and, mm -hmm. and research kind of life cycles are very different in, in data science generally, but particularly in health data science, you, you've got a really good, robust uh, set of sort of training around a clinician, but they're quite particular about the way that they take on board evidence and what it will take before they'll actually change the way they practice. Yeah. They don't want to make mistakes. You don't want to have errors that lead to poor outcomes. But we've got that sort of that difficulty of, you know, making a pretty established kind of industry uh, think differently and, and use things differently. So this is the, almost the regulatory side of that. There's the consumer buy-in side as well. You can't, you can only do good data science with good data. Yeah. And can you get good data in health? Well, what is that often means getting your hands on personal data, which people haven't given their sort of open consent for their data to be used in whatever way we might want to, to use it. And we need a really robust conversation and good set of tools around protecting people's privacy mm -hmm. and making sure we understand what the limits are of what we should or should not be doing with this technology. So there's massive barriers. But I, I think of those as opportunities more than barriers in terms of just bringing the public and the industry along the same journey together to understand, you know, what do people really think about the use of their data? Mm. And I think, you know, COVID uh, experience of the last few years has accelerated the public understanding of what health data might be useful for. So we're we're much more comfortable these days with the idea that we might report on you know, case numbers in different localities and maybe the different types of profiles of the people that are getting COVID in what kind of situations. You know, that's just one example of, of any number of conditions that it's useful to analyze the data, target the treatment and actually respond to that. And so people are getting their heads around, you know, actually it's my data that's going into that study. It's my data that's part of that kind of general understanding. And I can see the public benefit in, in that whole ecosystem. Um, but I, but I think we've got to be really careful because it is one of these areas that, you know, one major mistake could put us back a few years in terms of what we call the social license or cultural license to do this work. Uh, because if you don't have the trust of the the citizens, then there's no chance of actually really making that progress and actually giving you know giving people the tools that that would be really beneficial. So, so that's the other really big area of challenge um, and barrier is that that real social cultural engagement, bringing people along the journey, making sure that we're asking the right questions and getting uh, and responding to the answers. They might not be the answers we want first up, but but again, you know, you take people through it and you'll get where you want to rather than just kind of force things into the, in, into being. So. 
I think those are the the two really big ones are the inertia on in the industry itself and then the the required sort of social engagement license around the, the use of the data. Um, and both, you know, we have a long way to go, but we're making really, really good progress. Great, great. And and one of one of the, the big topics in um in the first one that you mentioned is um data availability. Um so um part of it is where is it? Is it captured or not? And then another part is, uh, is it, um, are, are we able to get to it, link it and use it? Um, how, how, um, how are things looking from your perspective uh, on those fronts? Yeah, we've seen some really good advances in the ability to, to capture data and to put it into, into useful sort of versions for people to actually access research but yeah. we're still a long way from having really high quality high volume data mm. sets available for, particularly for health sort of machine learning type research that needs needs that volume with there are certain examples around the world there's an organization out of boston that have produced a data set called mimic and i always observe that almost every health data science project starts with a mimic data set because they're the ones who have released a really comprehensive de-identified data set that has lots of different fields in it and you can try lots of things and it's, you know, that's fairly open access. And what I'm expecting over the coming years is a lot more versions of things like that of us releasing de-identified versions of data so that the research community can develop technologies and techniques and then even the sort of healthcare community themselves can trial things in a in a safe environment. So that, you know, that that's a really big advance is actually the ability to de-identify data in a safe way and then release it. Uh, we've, we've ended up doing quite a lot of research just on that topic of how do you take real data, de-identify it without losing the value. And when I say without losing the value, there's there's lots of really challenging aspects to it. One of the mm-hmm. key ones is the, the issue of underlying bias in, in the data. So we... We're often concerned about minority groups who tend to have poorer outcomes in most systems around the world. Yes. And New Zealand's the classic situation where we inherit lots of models that were developed on the European population around the world. Yeah. And the question is always, how is it going to work for our more vulnerable populations, which tend to be biased towards specific and Maori populations? Correct. When we get to that sort of question, you then want to you know, get a de-identified data set and we want to make sure that mm-hmm. you can't re- re-identify people. Mm-hmm. And one thing that often happens when people do that is they strip out the minorities because they're re-identifiable. Yeah. By definition, there's not as many of them. Yeah. So we've had to think really carefully about, about how you actually go about that and do some clever things like you know oversampling in those groups yeah. or g- generating sort of fake records that are similar to yeah. real records and putting them alongside the real records so that yes. you have a, a corpus of data that allows you to make sure you have representation in the ultimate data set you end up using, not just stripped out and getting down to the simplest um, full data set. And there's all sorts of, you know, things that happen if you're not careful. You you end up, you know, if you're wanting to do data research in general, you want the highest quality data, so you take out the people that have low quality data. Who are those people? Those are the people that tend to not access health very well or not have digital health records. Therefore, they're not represented in the data you use to build your algorithm. Therefore, your algorithm's not as likely to be suitable for them. So there's this massive kind of cyclical kind of process that if you're not careful, you get into this this really frustrating cycle where you're doing better and better, but the gap between those doing the best and those doing the worst only gets bigger. So they you get incremental tiny improvements to those at the bottom and you get these massive improvements to those at the top. And that happens because of the way we do our data science, but also it happens because of the access that people have to the techniques and tools that we produce as a result. So, you know, there's just this, this real challenge around how do you do good data science well and good not just in the quality and having a really good area under the curve, but but genuinely good. You're, you're trying to meet some, some genuine targets, um, which have to be more than just the average gets better because um, it's easy to get the best a bit better. <laughs> It's hard to get the the the, the um the, those who are struggling and you know are not going to be first in line to get this new technology or to to get to that um that big flash medical center to get in into the trial. Um, so mm-hmm. thinking really carefully about how you design a really good system to to account for those is is really critical here. Mate, that's ace. And with that, you covered 
my question and my follow-up questions, because my follow-up questions were going to be around, you know, the, the 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 second aspect that you mentioned, which was the social license, and the biggest blunders that you can make in the social license, uh, at least from my perspective, is on privacy or ethical ethical application and and um and for example, continually to disadvantage minorities through AI, things like that. So you're mate, all all over it. Um, I want to ask you. Um, I do want to get to asking you about some of the um, some of the applications and the projects that you guys have been working on. But before that, um, I wanted to ask you how 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 much does the healthcare system in um, New Zealand um, influence the type of work and research that you guys can do or or focus on um, and. Or, or do you focus on doing things that are um, more from a global perspective? What What are the implications of operating within that healthcare system? Yeah, it's a great question, and we we actually wrestle with it a bit because we're a New Zealand partnership. But our particularly our research and commercial organisations are more focused outside of New Zealand than in in terms uh-huh. of ultimate impact. Uh, because again, New Zealand's New Zealand's a small population. We obviously want to see really good outcomes for New Zealand and the New Zealand health system. But you know, when you're talking about health data science and the impact, um, it's a global thing. We think New Zealand is a really interesting, unique kind of setup because we actually have pretty high quality data collection in New Zealand. We've had a national health and yeah. a national health ID number has been in place in New Zealand for a couple of decades now. So you've got the ability to link different parts of your health journey together in a way that's actually quite difficult in a lot of countries. Yes. Um, yeah. And I didn't realize. Yeah, that's I'm really extremely yeah. jealous. That's amazing. Yeah, so it's pretty powerful. The the frustrating thing is that it can be linked, but it isn't always linked yeah. in the sense right. that it doesn't it doesn't live in one place. It's it's yeah. still lots of data sets in different places that you have to bring together, but you can. And even further than that, New Zealand's gone into an area called the integrated data infrastructure, which is actually linking health to other social services. So that is your education record, maybe yep. your criminal record, maybe your benefits, yes. all these maybe housing and all these things are social determinants of health. Correct. Health influences those, those influence health. And we now have the power to bring data together that really uh, allows us to ask questions like, you know, what's the relationship between the getting your dental checkup as a child and, mm-hmm. um, and your education outcomes later in life? Correct. Which may, you know, so all of these things are really hard to get if you can't sort of link different data sets and do it over a longish period of time. So, so, so New Zealand's kind of provides what I think is a beautiful test bed. Uh, the yes. goal is for this to be relevant to the world. You know, we do have wow. some of those unique population groups, but actually every area, every area in the world has a unique population group, and it's no, it's generally not that different the overall scenario which is a minority group tends to be left behind because the system is built for the majority Mm -hmm. and if we can get good at understanding how to engage with New Zealand's minority groups um, particularly Māori and Pacific we have a treaty um, relationship with Māori people and we've just reformed the health system to have a a proper Māori health authority that are, are really setting policy and and really engaging in the way that healthcare is delivered. And, and what that really means from a data science perspective is we need, we're thinking really carefully about engaging right from the beginning in understanding which communities need what outcomes and, and how, how do you actually make sure that you're going to uh, have a really positive experience and outcome for everybody, um, but particularly for those who otherwise would struggle. Um, so that relationship between New Zealand and the world, we, we, we just think of New Zealand you know, we're passionate, obviously, about our people in New Zealand, and we want to do work that, that that works for New Zealand. But we do it with a mindset of, and we want to take that to other parts of the world. Many health systems around the world started out of the sort of a Commonwealth model. UK has sort of led the way with the NHS model, and you know, roughly speaking, New Zealand, Australia, Canada. We've all followed a you know a similar basis for the type of health systems, and therefore we find that the technologies often are quite easily adapted into those into those different areas. Uh, you do have you know big differences in places like United States that have a much more private oriented system, but that just sets up a slightly different set of incentives and a set of you know 
data that gets captured and can be used in different ways. But fundamentally, you're still all answering, asking the same question, right? How do we how do we deliver better outcomes that are particularly helpful to those who need them the most? And how do you do it without it costing more, ideally costing less? Um, and, you know, no one loses by answering that question well. Exactly, exactly. That's, ah, uh, that's why I'm so yeah, excited about this chat and your work. Uh, this is phenomenal. Um, so, so can we dive into outcomes a little bit? Um, so, um, yeah, tell me about your approach with outcomes that usually, usually tricky, tricky to, um, to, to measure, to get the data, um, get it at a volume. Um, but it, it's critical to be able to improve the system as a whole. Um, so many, so many benefits um, from your perspective. Tell me, tell me about outcomes. Sure. So let me illustrate a couple of different sort of timescale type outcomes to, yeah. to give you an idea of the sort of work we do. We've been a health research partnership for about six years. And one of the first projects we kicked off was a project on surgical outcomes in New Zealand. Uh -huh. And it was observed by some of our clinicians that, you know, they were using a risk model that essentially helped prioritize people for treatment yeah. and give them advice that was based on a, a UK study from a, a relatively small cohort uh, internationally. And they they had the had a feeling but didn't have the evidence to show that it wasn't working that well for, for some people in New Zealand. So we recognise that New Zealand actually has a national data set on outcomes for, for health that could be pulled together. And so we were able to analyse all surgeries in New Zealand uh, over a five-year period and say, can we predict outcomes in, of different forms for those people and so that that really sort of led on this journey of okay we can we can start to see you know mortality was is sort of the obvious outcome to, to think about with surgery and so we were looking at different time frames so within 30 days within a year within two years what you know what tends to happen and within that you could then start to say well on average, these international models are, are about right for the people in the middle of the sort of bell curve, if you like, but yeah. the highest risk people were being missed uh, because in New Zealand, they just have a different profile. Um, but because we had a New Zealand data set, we could then reform those types of algorithms and really say, these are the people who are likely to have poorest outcomes. And, you know, that, that sort of a model has led to a number of what, ways of thinking about how you actually treat people so it helps people at both ends of the scale so you've got a conversation with someone about their outcomes um, who's like who's at high risk of a poor outcome and so for them it might be a conversation about if, is this the right thing to do you might you might um, think about not going ahead with the surgery if you're if the chances aren't so good and then at the other end of the scale people who it's absolutely confident that the outcomes will be good you can reduce the number the additional appointments that people are having to go and you know get lots of extra checkups just in case because you know the, the modeling suggests that that's that's not a good use of their time and so you know we've, again we focus sort of on you know really specific outcomes starting with mortality but fortunately most people don't die after yeah. surgery um and you know you usually don't go ahead uh with with surgery on people who are who are highly likely to die mm -hmm. there are certain conditions where it's where it's higher risk but actually, you know, people are really interested in other quality of life type metrics. And we had to look really broadly on what, what kind of metrics were relevant. So it's actually really hard to know what, what's a uniform kind of way of thinking about quality of life after surgery. Um, we've landed on using something called Days Alive Out of Hospital, which is a bit of a mouthful, but the short version is in the 90 days following surgery, how many of those are spent at home independently versus in hospital. So it accounts for the idea that you don't want to send people home early to then have to come back. Obviously, um, if, if if you do have a mortality situation, then then you get no days at, at alive out of hospital. Um, but, but you then sort of, it, it gave us a, a, a common language across multiple types of surgery to then say, well, there's much more nuanced kind of differences because then the conversation with someone ahead of ahead of surgery is, you know, this is what usually happens. Are you ready for that kind of experience? Do you have the support you need? Mm -hmm. And you know, what what are we what are we seeing? And you can also look at differences at different hospitals, differences by different conditions. So we've led, you know, it's led to this really nice sort of long-term study in outcomes from surgery that we've sort of put some tools in the hands of the surgeons now to, to really understand, you know, that conversation that you have with a patient or their family, um, you know, what, what tools do you need? 
probably the other end I was going to say really quickly. I might be. Yeah, no, this is great. I'm so impressed. Yeah, please. Um, but, but on the on the shorter term, quick turnaround, the, the work that we did in COVID, um, and it's been a, a few different things, as you can imagine, as a as a health data science organization um, has been really at the end of the scale where you know you need an answer yesterday. Um, outbreaks happening. How do you how do you get the information you need to the people who need it? And we've taken on a number of different challenges within that. One of the ones more recently is actually prioritizing people to get called when they have a positive test. So someone tests positive for COVID, they register it in New Zealand as a, as a positive case. We can't call everybody yeah. and we shouldn't, um, but we would like to know who the most vulnerable people are. Yeah. The nice thing with the way that COVID sort of evolved is we, we collect really good data and we're much better now at sort of quickly getting that data into the hands of the data scientists to say, well, let's let's build a you know hospital admission model based on what we've learned so far. And so we can look in fairly real time sense who's most likely to end up in hospital based on other similar cases in, in recent time. And so you know, we've obviously built, built those models so that you can essentially predict who's the most likely to end up hospitalized in, mm. um, when they have a COVID case. And that's led to, it's been part of an initiative that we've called the New Zealand Algorithm Hub, where we're actually hosting a range of models that are freely available in New Zealand that are available primarily around COVID-related risk models. Wow. So you can go to a website and put your inputs in, um, and get your sort of risk score out of it. But you can also, we've released APIs. So anyone who wants to can build their own app or their own dashboard and use a same validated New Zealand model that's been tested to be appropriate to our population. And we're you know, guaranteeing that the technology will do the same thing each time you run it. And you know, in a world where we had hundreds of people with their Excel spreadsheets and, and database models and, and you know, really, really good work happening everywhere, we really needed to just get, okay, let's just let's have a, a few standard models that everyone can trust, everyone knows is, is at least a backup, even if, you, even if you want to build your own, have this to test against. Um, so we've got this thing called the Algorithm Hub, which is, I think, a really cool initiative Starting out of COVID, but actually going into all of health, where where we can we can have a really good conversation around what are the models that are appropriate to be part of someone's care. How do you validate that you're happy with that? So we've got a governance framework around that, and lots of good conversations around things like the social license and the impact on minority groups, and then being able to put a line in the sand and say this this is safe, this is good, and we believe you know this is the right model for this current context, and people can use it in lots of different ways as a result. Phenomenal, mate! I'm so impressed. Um, can you can you tell me more about the the the, the model of uh, your organization? So, um, working with research corporates, um, yeah. How how does the model work? Yeah, so the model is actually based on a partnership concept that the New Zealand government has supported in other in other industries, and we're sort of the health data version of it, um, where you know they are incentivizing working together across the industry. And so what we we sort of have a, a, a fund available, if you like, uh, through the government that has certain conditions on it, including that there's multiple organizations and there's both commercial and health, health outcomes from it. So the way that we operate is we've got a pretty lean operational sort of team. And then what we end up supporting are collaborations that have people from multiple organizations. So we, we typically... You know, I have a health director, a commercial director, a Maori director, um, and a science director as my sort of core management leadership team that help sort of assess what are the initiatives that are going to add the most value. And as a team, we we both initiate projects and receive proposals for projects. And usually we take a project idea and we will shape it into something that sort of fits the the culture of what we're trying to create. So you get that collaboration, uh, get that focus on equity, and but um, also with that sort of commercial ro roadmap to it, put the right people in a team together and then uh, sort of support a, a project that, that really bring, brings together all those elements. So the, the way that it sort of ends up working is, you know, we'll, we'll work quite closely with a potential research team over time, and then we'll take that to our advisory group and ultimately our board to, to sort of set off an initiative. Um, and, you know, we've had a, about 100 projects in the, in the last six years, um, ranging from, you know, a good number of those are, are student projects that are relatively small, but then a handful of them are, 
you know, million dollar initiatives around particular risk models that we're going to build and then deploy um, in the New Zealand context too. So it's a really cool collaborative kind of kind of setup and you know, relies on a lot of people and a lot of organizations all sort of weighing in. Um, but sort of at its core, you've got commitment from the government and from some of the commercial parties, particularly Orion Health in New Zealand, who's, who really kicked this off, who've sort of put some, some backing behind it to kind of get this initiative up and running. Um, but over time, you know, welcoming lots of other partners into it um, so that we can, you know, help help either, anything from a um, sort of a small to medium type, size organization to a, to a larger one um, really figure out what it means to do really good get data science in a, in a health context. Right, that's outstanding. And how can uh, people and organizations get involved? Yeah, so we've we've got our, as you can have a look at our website, precisiondrivenhealth.com. Um, I'm on Twitter at, at Health Precision um, to, to sort of to follow us, um, certainly reach out and, 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 and have a look. Um, you know we're we're often traveling and, and speaking at different things and and we're really keen actually to collaborate with others who have similar initiatives around the world that you can you can gain a lot by sort of doing the same type of work in different countries and so we're we're really keen to find those partners in other places that have similar interests um wanting to try some of the stuff we've built and wanting to tell us about stuff that they've got and and you know see if we can see if we can do something together so um, certainly love to love to hear from people in that in that area Amazing, mate. Thank you so much. This has been mind blowing. Uh, the work that you guys do is so, so, so exciting. Um, yeah, I encourage anyone who is interested to reach out. Um, yeah, discuss opportunities, uh, both for collaboration, for support, um, do some research. This is exactly the type of uh, work and initiatives that we should be supporting and doing more of. So Kevin, thank you so much for your time and for all the work that you and your team do. Thanks for this fun. Thanks for watching this video all the way to the end. I hope that you got a lot out of this discussion. And if you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe to the channel um, so more people can find out about the challenges that leaders have in the analytics and AI space. And that's what we're trying to share in Data Futurology. Uh, so please like and subscribe. And if you enjoyed today's episode, uh, please tell your friends. Thank you so much.